So welcome to all of our, our participants to PeaceCon 2020's presentation of Women Building Inclusive Peace, Innovative Approaches from Nigeria and the United States. This session is being recorded. I'm Kat Lachman. I am the session moderator, and I'm participating from Washington, D.C. on the behalf of the Global Peace Foundation. With me on this impressive uh, panel of experts are uh, uh, Sophia Ibn Garba, who is uh, just joining us. Glad to see you. Haranessa Fariad, Becca Pugh, and Father Canis Anyake. I am delighted to uh, be on uh, a, a such a great panel with these leaders who will be uh, uh, sharing about their organization's case studies, innovative approaches, and outcomes from work both in the United States and Nigeria. Today's topic, Women Building Inclusive Peace, really resonates with me personally and professionally, and we hope it will resonate with each of you as our experts share about their peace building initiatives and activities in a variety of contexts and highlight women's roles and dynamics in local peace building. We really appreciate our audience members joining from all over the world as well. And it's great seeing in the, in the comments folks joining in from uh, the Washington DC area, as well as Pittsburgh, uh, uh, Philly and, and other places. Um, folks on our panel are, are joining from all over the world as well. So to start out with, uh, we would love to uh, start with a short poll and I'm going to paste that directly into the comments and invite each of you to uh, uh, check out that poll. You can click on it in the click the link in the comments and go ahead and answer the question which is how would you rate inclusive peace building in your community and by inclusive what we mean is ensuring the representation of vulnerable groups uh, perhaps different sides of a conflict uh, uh, different sides of politics and including women in the processes as well as government and political elite. So that's the question and we'd love to know how you again would rate inclusive peace building in your community. So please do go ahead and take that poll uh, and we're also going to uh, share the results. Give everyone a moment to take it. Click on your response. And there are the responses. So uh, uh, based on our audience's response, we would say, we see that 35.7% uh, answered a little. So uh, 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 inclusiveness is rated at a little, oh no, 43.8. A little, 43.8, somewhat the same, 43.8. Only 12.5% rating high or very high. So uh, it looks like we, 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 we give ourselves a kind of mediocre grades uh, 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 across here. And it'll be very interesting to hear some perspectives on how we can drive, uh, drive these questions, dri drive the inclusiveness forward. And then let's take the second question. Uh, if you would like to uh, answer, who would you consider leading actors in peace building in your country? Youth, women, civil society, communities themselves, or the media? Go ahead and answer that, and then we'll take a look at the results. Hmm. 
Well, we're having some technical difficulties showing uh, results for the uh, for the second question. Uh, uh, apologies on that. Let's move ahead, though. Uh, I am sure that our first speaker, who I am happy to uh, to introduce, uh, has some great perspectives on these questions and many others about inclusive peace building. So it is my pleasure to introduce to you Safaya Ibn Garba, uh, uh, calling in from Oman, Jordan, and representing Generations for Peace. Thank you, Kat. Can everyone hear me? Just give me, if you're on video, give me a thumbs up. Excellent, thank you. Uh, can I have the next slide? Okay. All right, so uh, I'm Sophia from Generations for Peace, as Kat has said, and I'm really, really pleased uh, to be here. And I'm actually extra pleased because I see in our chat box, we have some folks from Nigeria, so welcome. And um, also, of course, welcome to everyone uh, on the session today. Um, so let's talk about Generations for Peace and the work we've been doing in, um, in the world, but in Nigeria particularly. So Generations for Peace is um, an international nonprofit, non-governmental peace building organization. We are headquartered in Jordan, but we are global in reach. Um, our vision is sustainable peace in actively tolerant communities through responsible citizenship. And our mission is to empower youth to lead and cascade, so pass on sustainable change in communities experiencing conflict uh, through world-class education in conflict transformation and the use of, listen to this, sport, arts, advocacy, dialogue, and empowerment for peace building. That herein comes your innovative approaches. Let's uh, dig a little more in. Um, so uh, I'm sure my CEO will be happy with that uh, introduction. Um, one of the things I really want to highlight is the use of different vehicles for peace building. So we speak of the use of sport-based games, uh, the use of arts, advocacy, dialogue, and empowerment. And uh, so far, we have um, trained uh, over 19,000 volunteers and all over 1.3 million uh, children, youth, and adults have been engaged through our programs across 51 countries. We also have the Generations for Peace Institute, which is um, involved in research, outreach, advocacy, and policy. We have also been named uh, the uh, to number 26, ranked 26 amongst the top 500 NGOs in the world by NGO Advisor. So that is on a global scale. What about Nigeria itself, where I'm obviously from? Um, we have worked in Nigeria for 12 years, and in doing so, we've been, uh, engaged and implemented 21 peace building programs and initiatives that have engaged over 7,500 girls, women, and youth. We've done that across four local governments uh, in Kaduna, and so you can see that it comes from, goes from the um, overall country down to Kaduna State, which is located in northwest Nigeria, and then uh, across four local government uh, areas and more than 30 communities. So what is it we have been doing in those places? Well, first of all, we've worked with a lot of uh, women, more than 60 women who are 25 and above across eight ethnic groups. If you know anything about Nigeria, you know we have more than 250 ethnic groups, a uh, recipe maybe for disaster, you would say, but a very good opportunity for building on and leveraging our diversity. Uh, these women have come from two religions and we try to look at it from another angle and looking at it from um, addressing issues of inclusion in community level decision making. So giving them opportunities to sit at tables that they may not ordinarily uh, sit at. And that meant looking at their empowerment as women. Uh, what are the skills? Do they have the competencies to engage in decision making in conflict transformation? So over four years, we implemented four Empowerment for Peace programs. And we looked at the lack of women's empowerment and inclusion at the community level, as well as their limited ability uh, due to different reasons for conflict transformation and peace building. What we found out from those programs are that we, um, we received um, a significant improvement of 30% amongst the women who said they felt more equipped for decision-making and conflict transformation. We also uh, evaluated and, and um, 
we, and achieved a 33% improvement in the number of women who felt more confident to participate in decision making. There was also a 40% uh, improvement in terms of the women who felt that the community heads allowed women to take part in decision making. So this was about not just recognizing the lev uh, and leveraging the agency of women, but saying, okay, non-traditionally, what are the other things that we can do to empower and support women for their voices to be heard, for them to be at tables they may not ordinarily be at? For example, at the community level, they may not have had an opportunity to contribute to decision making. And, um, you know, if you've read about the context, and you probably heard about this in the news, you will see from the picture on the left, this is uh, an example of the physical effects of violence, uh, where one of our volunteers is standing in a church that has been destroyed due to a religious, um, uh, through to a crisis. So it is about saying, what are the, the non-traditional ways that we can engage women um, in, in the community? Secondly, we felt that it was important to work not only with adult women, but also younger adolescents, uh, even younger sometimes, uh, adolescents and uh, younger women. So uh, um, we had 11 Sport for Peace programs for youth. Again, this is about uh, more non-traditional ways to engage them and using different vehicles. So Nigeria has been one country where we have um, implemented all of Generations for Peace uh, vehicles for peace building. Now in these, in these uh, Sport for Peace programs for youth, we engaged uh, students in four secondary schools uh, and some older male youth. And, um, you know, they were across 18 ethnic groups, 10 communities, two religions, and so on. And the things that we have um, achieved through those are, or include a 60% improvement in the participants' rating of their own leadership skills and a decrease in their rating, uh, their leadership skills as low. So we saw people young people taking on this responsibility and understanding that for me to make a change, whether now or in the future, I need to, to develop my leadership skills. We also um, saw an increase of 22% in the number of target group members, that's those who uh, engage in the activities, in their own knowledge of conflict transformation skills as high. So they felt they knew more about conflict transformation. Now, lastly, I'm going to talk about something you've also probably seen in the news, the end SARS uh, protests, uh, SARS in this case, not, not the, the other pandemic, but SARS meaning uh, the special anti-robbery squad, which is what was all about um, pol police brutality. And we saw a lot of women take a leading role in, um, in leading these protests. So you had women at the forefront calling for change, calling for uh, a better living standard. It's not over yet, it's still on, but we've seen such a great civil movement of youth and particularly women leading protests, asking for change and a better standard of living, which leads one of the things that leads to peace in the community. We have noticed that it's incredibly important to give women, girls and women, leadership roles, even at a younger age, like you can see through this activity, you give them this, they learn more and more. And uh, it's important for them to be mentored as well by uh, adult or older women and, and men as well in the community. Um, we've also found that it's incredibly important to find more, more and more non-traditional ways, innovative ways to engage women and girls and elevate and amplify their voices, not just them, but, and, and you find that in, in lots of those situations, they end up speaking for their group, their identity group and other vulnerable groups. So it's incredibly important to provide those spaces as well as monitor, see how it goes and continue to provide support for girls and women to lead innovative change, including in peace building. Uh, thank you so much. I'm gonna hand back over to Kat. Thank you very much, Sophia. Uh, I love to hear your case studies and see your evaluation results. They're always very impressive and I wish we had time to dig deeper, uh, but thank you very much. Uh, and now moving on, 
I would like to welcome two of my other colleagues to the floor who, who are uh, Becca uh, Pugh from uh, Peace Catalyst International and also her Anessa Ferrari from the Adams Center. Thank you very much, ladies. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Becca Pugh, and as Kat mentioned, I'm the program coordinator for Peace Catalyst International here in the Washington, D.C. area. And I've been collaborating with her Anissa for Peace locally over the past year together, and we're excited to share about what that's looked like for us. So I'll let her Anissa introduce herself. Hi, guys. I'm her Anissa Fariad. I head the outreach and interfaith department at the All Dulles Area Muslim Society, also known as the Adam Center. I've been working very closely with Peace Catalyst for the past almost three years, and we're excited to kind of showcase some of the things that we've been uh, doing for the past three years, especially with the involvement of women and youth. Great. So um, as for an Hernessa mentioned, um, we've been partnering together mainly through the Adams Center, um, which is the second largest mosque in the US. And I've been kind of collaborating with my local Christian community. Um, Peace Catalyst International is a faith-based organization focused on bringing together Muslims and Christians for peace. And our vision is based on the fact that more than half of the world's population is made up of Muslims and Christians. And if we can't have peace between these two groups of people, then there's little hope for peace in the world as a whole. And so our mission is to create loving initiatives that um, bring together Muslims and Christians in a safe space to build authentic relationships, um, increase trust and foster mutual understanding. And we do that through experiential learning teaching and training, community service and activism, and network building. And here we have just a snapshot of our 2019 impact. So as you can see, we have most of our programs across the U.S. focused on bringing together evangelical Christians and Muslims. Um, so we've had 271 peacemaking events in 64 cities with almost 9,500 Muslim and Christian participants. We've had seven community resilience plans in major U.S. cities, including the Washington, D.C. area that her and Issa has worked on, um, and she can share more about that. And we also have teams in Indonesia, Bosnia, and Nepal. Um, but one of our major focus areas in the U.S. is um, within the evangelical Christian community where there has been a lot of, um, you know, rampant Islamophobia. Um, but we also see fear, misunderstanding, and a lack of trust from both sides. And so we try to bring together people in the middle to see that um, we actually have so much more in common than we do that separates us. And so one of the most important um, aspects of our work locally is the fact that we are building authentic relationships together as women of faith who are leading the way because oftentimes in the faith space, you know, men dominate and women um, don't have the same access or visibility in terms of leadership. Um, so her and us and I have been seeking to forge the way forward um, for women and demonstrating that we can come together as women across different faith lines to um, have authentic relationships with each other and also foster that amongst uh, members of our faith communities. So um, two, PCI has seven theories of change and two of them are contact theory and the demonstration effect. So contact theory is essentially that when people of different groups come together and they have contact with each other, it'll you know increase understanding, it'll decrease fear, mistrust. But of course, we know that just simply having contact in and of itself is not going to reduce fear or prejudice or increase trust. It, it takes something more. And Hernes and I have been trying to foster that more in the DC area over the past year. Um, We've done community service events together. We've had many like panel discussions and experiential learning events, which we'll talk more about. But one of the keys for us too, is the fact that her and and I are friends outside of our work. So we are building authentic relationship with each other and then modeling that for our communities. 
So when people see that we have friendship and we share life together, it increases their own interest and their own desire even to want to build relationships across faith lines. And I'll let her Nissa, talk more about uh, mutual respect. Thank you so much, Becca. So in this line of work, it's really important for us to know who we are and what we believe in and be really confident in that field. Majority of the times, if we go into an event or we go to a multi-faith work, a lot of people go into it trying to convert other people or disrespect other people in their faith. And if we're coming from that perspective, this work will not get done. So we have to be first confident in who we are and then at the same time respect accept and understand the people who we're working with because their faith may not be like ours and they have every right to worship the way they want. This interaction is not about conversion. It's about working together to ameliorate a situation or two within your community that really needs to be addressed, whether it's homelessness, whether it's domestic violence, whether it's, you know, women getting a chance to be at the table like Sophia, you know, did such a great job pointing out the work that they're doing in Nigeria. So all of these things are coming together because we're understanding that. We can't move ahead if we're trying to... Uh, put under somebody under us or trying to make them think like the way we do. So we're all coming in this together, understanding that our mutual respect is the fact that we own who we are, but we also accept and respect and understand the person that we're working with. And like Becca said, we're actually really good friends. We go out to eat, we hang out, we make each other laugh. And that's part of the process also is to have that personal relationship with the people you're working with, because it is important to build on that aspect as well. Countering Islamophobia is um, definitely something that is uh, on the forefront of PCI's work with the Adam Center. We're doing a lot of conversation, sitting down with people, letting them get to know us and who we are, because we see that Islamophobia is very uh, rampant within the evangelical Christian community because of the misunderstanding that they have. And they really have not actually, a lot of them sat down with Muslims and had a conversation or did any projects or actually have been given a chance to get to know who we are. And I think when we are doing these projects and we're bringing people together all across the United States that uh, PCI is working on right now, it's actually giving evangelical Christians a taste of who the Muslim communities uh, within their communities are, who the Muslims are, what they're doing, what they're about, and what it is they want to do, and how do they worship God, and how is it that their family structure is is set. So all these things are, are being in line with getting to know one another, but through a very natural and uh, open process where people are understanding Muslims and countering Islamophobia through real life interactions instead of actually hearing something on the news. I'll send it back to Becca now. Yeah, so well said. And um, yeah, so, and I'm so grateful to be partnering with her, Anessa, because like she said, she's been working with Peace Catalyst longer than I have. <laughs> and then I came into the area and we've been having an awesome time collaborating locally. And part of that is building a local network and coalition of faith members and leaders. So we have brought together people from our separate communities and networks to build friendships and relationships with each other and find ways to collaborate for peace. So um, one of our major initiatives over the past year was bringing Muslims and Christians together for community service at a local community center in Southeast Washington, DC in Randall Highlands. And it was a beautiful chance for us to recognize that um, when we come together for the flourishing of our communities, it helps us to recognize that, wow, we, we both care about these things affecting our communities, right? Muslims and Christians, we live in the same neighborhoods. We, we share grocery stores and movie theaters and shopping centers. And we have things that common concerns and issues that we care about. So um, with PCI, we try to bring together Muslims and Christians to um, contribute towards the flourishing of our shared communities through community service. So Seek the Peace is uh, one of the initiatives that I personally really uh, admire and I enjoy being a part of. As you can see in that middle picture, uh, I'm moderating that event at the Adams Center and that's something Becca and I put together. The lady next to me is a scholar of the Methodist tradition. Next to her is a Franciscan scholar. Next to him is an imam of our masjid, one of the imams. And then next to the imam is a Baptist pastor. And 
we brought them together to talk about Jesus and G who Jesus, um, sorry, Mary, mother of Jesus within the different um, faith traditions. And, uh, you know, although we can say like three out of the four are coming from the Christian faith, even their perspectives on, you know, some details is different. Um, but I wanted to point that out to our community who was sitting in the audience and people from different faith backgrounds also came. And they actually, actually at the end of it, were very grateful that we were able to bring a different perspective and not just one Christ Christian perspective in the, in the conversation. And they learn about, you know, even from the Muslim perspective and how we see women and Mary in our faith tradition has a whole chapter dedicated to her in our holy book, the Quran. And the, the Baptist pastor actually came at the end and said, you know, I didn't even know that Muslims believed in Mary or that she even has a whole chapter just dedicated to her. He's like, that's really cool. And of course, that incites conversation, that incites uh, relationship. And I have a pretty good relationship with everybody on, on the panel here. And so does Becca. But of course, we have to initiate these conversations. We have to bring conversations to the table where we can see that majority of how all the people view it is, is the same. We, we walked out with very little differences. There are people in the audience who wanted to ask inappropriate questions, but I was filtering through it. And that's something Becca and I uh, talked about is that we are not going to ask questions that were controversial or trying to disrespect anyone. And somebody was trying to be disrespectful. And we said, no, we're not even going to ask your question because that has nothing to do with what we're trying to foster here. So we have to be you know, intentional in blocking negative negativity or people who want to actually deconstruct what we're actually putting together. And then we had another event uh, a few months later at a church on Jesus and who Jesus is in the Christian faith and in the Muslim faith. And the audience was mixed between Muslims and Christians as well. Again, fostering this type of conversation that will bring people together, but then have them actually go out and do work because conversation without actually doing work within the community is, is, is just not productive. And it's just a regular cycle that we have to move from. Back up. Yep. And um, this photo here on the right is from one of our recent events during COVID-19. So we found ways to build peace um, through dialogue and scriptural reasoning and experiential learning virtually even during COVID-19. And so this was from one of our events during Ramadan in which um, her and Issa and an Imam named Imam Ali Siddiqui gave us insight into, you know, what what the Muslim experience of Ramadan is and how that's different during COVID-19. It was just an opportunity for us to come together for dialogue and learning um, to better understand our Muslim neighbors. And here we just have a snapshot snapshot of our 2019-2020 impact. So we've engaged more than 250 new community members in the DC area um, with more than 15 peacemaking gatherings, both in person and virtually. Um, these are some of our major partnerships. Obviously, the Adams Center, Islamic Relief USA, who, part, who um, gave us a grant for the community service project that we did last year, which was at the DC Dream Center. Um, and then those are some of our other partners. And we've also had um, opportunity for cross-state virtual engagement during COVID-19. And these are some of our upcoming projects. Um, the first one is a peace building manual to equip local faith communities. Um, and we're actually partnering with the Center for World Religions, Diplomacy and Conflict Resolution at George Mason University. Um, for this, they're gonna be providing research support and it's essentially creating programming guide for local faith communities Christians and Muslims who want to engage with each other, but they aren't sure where to start or they don't know how to gain traction with that. So we're gonna be equipping those communities. Um, second one is a, um, oh, I'll let Hernessa talk about that project actually. <laughs> Thanks, Becca. So harnessing neuroscience and the arts to reduce biases. So basically, um, we've noticed and we're going to go in, in the next slides when we go into the youth choir that we're going to be talking about in terms of how to get science, the, the neuroscience of, of what we're doing in connection with performing arts and how that has actually been a tool that has not been used, but should be used because it's actually something that we've seen bringing about really positive change, things that we can actually do with the youth and getting the youth engaged. Because normally when we say multi-faith work, all we're seeing is people who are above 50, who are retired, who really have time because they're retired to do this work. But we need to get people who are much younger and getting the youth involved at a younger age, but it can't be the regular type of dialoguing and, and 
events that we're doing with the adults because um, if you work with children, you know they get bored really fast and you can't do boring with kids. So we're looking up through innovative ways of getting them involved and we'll talk about that a little bit later. And then scriptural reasoning is something that we just recently started with some of the members here in the DMV area with DC, Maryland and Virginia, but we do have some people calling in from Pennsylvania and other states as well. It's just a way of picking a scripture and seeing how, you know, the three different faiths talk about a specific topic and then bringing commonality through that conversation and learning about one another and saying, oh yeah, you know, 95% of what we're reading is all the same. And again, it's bringing back that commonality and conversation and having the uh, opportunity to get to know one another and then building those bridges to go back out into the community and actually do things that are changing our community and, and making it better regardless of whatever event or, or project that you're uh, taking part in. And I did wanna mention also in terms of, of women being a, 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 an intricate role player in all of this work is that, um, you know, women are not given the seat in multi-faith work. And a lot of the times we have to make the space for ourselves. So it's important for women to feel empowered by the work that's going on in, in all of these different segments that you're going to listen to today so that you can't, you know, say that I'm, I'm not given the opportunity that I'm just going to sit back. No, we have to move forward, find innovative ways to get the message across. Yes, absolutely. I just wanted to add one other thing to um, another major program that PCI has is advocacy for the Uyghur population in China. Um, and that's something that we have worked on locally as well. Um, so I just wanted to, to mention that, but over to you, Kat. Great. Thank you very much, Becca and her and Essa. Uh, such fascinating work that you're doing. And uh, I look forward to seeing those future projects unfolding in the DC area in particular. Uh, and now I would like to shift gears and welcome uh, uh, Father Canis Anyake from the Global Peace Foundation. Father Canis is a, a colleague of mine, one of my favorite people, and he's a board member of Global Peace Foundation Nigeria. And he also serves our headquarters team based in Washington, DC as an outreach specialist and in particular for the interfaith community. Father Canis, we welcome you. Thank you, Kate. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I'm trying to get, okay. Yeah, we can. All right, go. okay, good. Um, thank you everyone for joining. I sincerely thank my fellow panelists. As Kat said, I am the uh, Program Development Specialist and Interfaith Outreach Representative for Global Peace Foundation. I am reaching you from our headquarters here in Washington DC area. And like Sophia, I'm from Nigeria. I'm excited to share with you the work of Global Peace Foundation in Nigeria, particularly and other parts of the world. Uh, Global Peace Foundation is an international nonprofit organization based in Washington, D.C. We promote um, the values-based approach to building sustainable peace and development at the local, national level and regional level across all our field affiliate network. We try to structure our programs around community peace building, democracy strengthening, election violence prevention, interfaith, collaboration, prevention of violent extremism, and youth radicalization. And every year, Global Peace Foundation reaches about 200,000 people in different parts of the world, partnering, partnering with um, 20 countries around the world. Let's look at the framework of Global Peace Foundation, especially with regards to our work in Nigeria. Our process is holistic peace building, uh, which encompasses various uh, programs uh, that are geared towards the transformation of um, relationship in communities, 
And we use the systems approach, which is very important because it pays attention to the assets that are valuable to different communities. You cannot uh, transform conflict without looking at the assets available to communities. We also look at the structures that operate within these communities and how these structures can affect the lives of individuals and communities. And our model is values-based, which are predicated upon certain universal principles and shared values. Most important among these is the belief that every human being is endowed with inherent value. It is the starting point of the process of positive change and relationship. And we try to carry this out in communities because these conflicts happen in communities. So we try to engage communities in a very organic manner. The, the background is very important. We are talking about the programs and projects we've carried out in two communities in Northern Nigeria, Kaduna State precisely. Kaduna is part of the Northwestern region of Nigeria. And Kanekon, which is one of the chiefdoms where we did our work, is a, a, a chiefdom in Jama local government. Kajuri is another community which is um, a local government in itself. And when you look at these issues, we try to, at the baseline study, we try to look at the political, economic, and social cultural issues in both Kanekon and Kajuru as we, um, you know, brought these interventions. So, so it, it, again, in both Kajuru and Kanekon, we looked at the causes and the triggers of conflict violence. Uh, it, it, importantly, we looked at the role of youth unemployment and disenfranchisement, ethnic frictions, the wrong use of religion and economic deprivations. Uh, and we found out that women were at the center of all these, especially as those mostly impacted. And the, the, the actors, both the local politicians and local leaders, the herdsmen, farmers, militia groups, all play a powerful role in what we saw in these two communities. But we, we, what we tried to do was to find out how inclusive peace building approach respected and promoted the role of women. So in, in our programs and projects in Ka Ka Kanekon and Kajuru, we involved 1,100 women in six essential program areas. The first is the um, capacity building workshops, which gave um, the communities the skills, the tools and ability to advance the peace process and also engage in early warning and prevention. Through that capacity building workshops, women were allowed a space in the public sphere, which of course, uh, we know that um, most of these areas and regions are very patriarchal, but the women participated in this process. Another program we came up with in both Kajuru and Kanekon was the, the Peace and Reconciliation Forum. It's a very important forum where women played a very important role in the process of working out from our narrow identities, the identity of ethnicity, the identity of religion, the identity of social status, because the women saw that they, they, we, they, had, they were common victims in all these, and they had a common identity beyond these narrow identities. So in this process of reconciliation and peace, 
the, the communities, especially the women, helped the different communities to engage in the rehumanization of the other person, looking at the other person as a human being, not just uh, as an enemy or an object. So, so again, we, we brought uh, the community dialogue forums. Now, one of, the, one of the ways we do our projects in different parts of the world, uh, particularly in Nigeria, it's what we call the pre-contact phase. At that phase, we met these communities differently. But this um, community dialogue brought the communities together in, a, in what we call manage contact phase, where people intentionally engage in true dialogue. Dialogue that saw the validity of the other person and the way the other person is also a human being. We also uh, introduced dialogue forums with the security agencies, which helped to regain trust. Because in most of these communities, the security agencies lost the trust of the people. And of course, you can't uh, engage in the peace process without trust. Trust helps to bring about healing. And women were the catalysts of this process in the communities. We also engage in community outreach, very important. These women all came together to see how all of them, we are part of the process of um, engaging one another, especially during the COVID-19, where women from different religious and ethnic fault lines all came together to support one another. And that really helped. The Okada riders, we call them in Nigeria, also we are part of this process with the women providing support to all of them. Uh, let's look at the outcome of these uh, six essential areas in Kaduna. Um, our, our outcomes are built around our uh, theory of change. So the, the first thing there is that there was an enhancement in the ability of these communities to come together as diverse communities focusing on change and structural uh, change, asset change, and of course systems change, where women played the role of leading the process. It strengthened the community's resilience against violent extremism. Because of the different committees we helped to build in these communities, early warning we are in, in, in these communities as part of the process of understanding what is coming. And again, the women came to realize that when a child is killed, when a girl is raped, it doesn't matter his, his or her religious affiliation or ethnic affiliation is a human being. So the women championed that. So they were at the forefront of fighting, uh, strengthening the community's resilience. And another outcome uh, is the enhanced partnership with security agencies through dialogue, trust was rebuilt. And of course, women in their very powerful way of doing things helped the men and the young men to come together with these security agencies to enhance uh, relationship. We did a, a, a pre um, program evaluation and post program evaluation and you can see the results and the indicators. Participants in Kajuru um, willing to interact with people of different faith and tribe increased after the programs. Participants in Kanekon who believe that their community has a plan to manage issues that could lead to violence also increased. And that's the transformation of relationship, you know, uh, championed by women, especially. The average participants in both local governments who agreed to work together to reduce violence and tension also 
increased after the programs. Now, now let's look at the impact. Women's voice and participation in a highly patriarchal structure. That's you know what we see in different African communities. But through these programs, women found their voice in these systems and the voice helped to bring about change and transformation in relationship. The effectiveness of women in the power of the periphery achieving sustainable peace, women in, in the grassroots structure are very, very effective. They are very, very important. They show that organic process of changing things and building sustainable peace because women can reach areas masculinity ordinarily cannot reach. And then women as catalysts in enhancing people to people engagement. People to people engagement works very well in grass. To navigate that process, you need the role of women. And we introduced uh, that approach in the six areas of engagement in this community so that people from a different community, either based on ethnic fault line or religious fault line, were able to move to the other community to have one-on-one -on -one engagement. Effective compassion as a collective experience. What we found out was that a couple of women from different ethnic and uh, social backgrounds focused on the well-being of their children. And I helped some young men to withdraw from the intention of joining these violent extremist groups because the women were working together in this whole process. And then finally, the deconstruction of victimhood. In both Kajiru and Kanekon, the women deconstructed victimhood to see themselves as actors and those who can engage in the peace process, not just as victims every moment. So looking at what um, these three, four organizations are doing, both here in the US and in Nigeria, it is only proper to recognize the important role of women in the peace community around the world today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Father Canis. Your insights are very well received. Uh, it, I would now like to call upon uh, my colleague, Hiranessa, once again. Hiranessa, one of the things that is uh, uh, most amazing that you're doing amongst so many things is uh, about the Adams Beat. And we didn't give you an opportunity to say a few words about that. And we would love to uh, offer you uh, a couple, a, a few extra moments here at the end, if you would like to share a little bit about this really interesting initiative. Thank you so much, Kat. I really appreciate it. So Adam's Beat is um, actually the first and only mosque youth choir in the United States. And that happened to start because I do have a music background and the imam of our masjid called me in and looked at me and said, I hear you have a music background. And I looked at him and was kind of frightened to answer the question. I thought, okay, I'm going to get in trouble for having a, you know, have studied music. But he was like, no, you're going to start a youth choir and the first one at a mosque in the United States. So these are um, when my kids <clears throat> first started uh, March of 2016. Um, and so I've had kids, you know, performing at very various different um events um and i have about 35 to uh, 40 boys and girls between the ages of 7 to 16 going around in the dmv area performing at different events uh the one you see here the picture of the George, georgetown university that was for the children of uh, yemen who were doing a, a, an awareness campaign there uh, we get invited to about 13 to 15 events every year um, the, the picture you see below at the Northern Virginia Hebrew Congregation, um, they actually sang a Hebrew song of peace that I taught them. And um, uh, at the end, a lot, all, it was a women's program. So all the women came hugging my kids and crying and 
saying that they sang it so beautifully and that they sang it better than the Jewish youth choir at the synagogue. And um, that made my kids really happy because they really wanted to portray something that was meaningful to the audience. Um, they've performed at numerous Shabbat uh, services, Sunday mass, uh, uh, Dr. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. weekend. They're booked uh, all four days and a lot of different social advocacy events as well. Um, the picture up there you see is the Washington National Cathedral and, um, you know, they've become the Muslim American ambassadors. And I tell them this so that they can build on their self-esteem as American Muslim youth, that they're doing great work and representing who we are as Muslims in the United States through music and through songs and songs that are powerful, you know, whether they're Nasheeds, which are Islamic songs or pop culture songs like Bruno Mars, Count on Me, Stand by Me, Lean on Me. I taught them all these different songs. And then obviously the Hebrew Song of Peace and other um, faith songs as well, so that they can be a tool to use for our multi-faith work and bringing people together, but through a very innovative and fun way. Um, they've performed with other kids from other faith groups as well. They've performed at the Wash, uh, the Ken, uh, the George, the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts with a Catholic uh, uh, school choir as well. And they sang a song called Salamu Alaikum, which was in Arabic, where we put in Hebrew words, uh, Spanish words, and then also American Sign Language as well. Again, these kids worked together, sang a song, and they made friendship um, through their faith background, knowing that they can do work together from a young age, but in a very fun and innovative way. Um, you know, now they're doing multi-faith work through their music. They've changed so many people's perspective on who Muslims are. Um, you know, they go up there, they're dressed properly, they perform properly, they're on cue and on point. And it really does a lot of different things for them. It, it affects their self-esteem. It shows the audience who American Muslim are in from a young perspective, but also these are kids who were born and raised here. And it also gives these kids an opportunity to be part of something that's bigger than themselves. You know, whether it's a climate march or uh, ending the gun violence vigil that they get to come and perform. And they're the only youth choir there. And all these churches have their own youth choir, but they always invite us to come and sing. And of course, multi-faith work for the youth is, is important. And I you know, implore anyone here who's listening who has some kind of talent, because we all have some kind of talent, right? Explore that within yourself. Find something that you can actually use to go back to your community and use with the youth that you have within your community to do this type of work. It can't be the same thing that you're doing with adults because children need fun. They need excitement. They need things that really resonate with them. And for us, music has really worked through that. And it gives them a, self, a lot of self-confidence and to be able to actually go out in the world and speak. A lot of these kids, when they started, would never speak in front of people. But now they're recording things. They're going in front of people and having conversations about their faith and interacting with people at a different age group as well. So I you know, would like everyone who's listening to actually get on point in terms of uh, getting the youth involved in their work. And that's just some of the work that uh, Adam's Beat Choir has been doing in the multi-faith world. That's great. Thanks a lot for sharing about that with us. I think it's really fascinating, and I'm I I I I hope that uh, once COVID is passed, that you all will uh, have more choir gigs. Absolutely, <laughs> <laughs> they're really cute and fun. So that it makes my life, you know, uh, fun too to hang around with them and work with them. And I think it's important to figure out these innovative ways to get the youth involved. I agree. I think it's really creative and uh, uh, I certainly celebrate that. Uh, please feel free to invite me. Um, so now let's shift gears and let's take some 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 questions uh, uh, from our audience. I was uh, uh, seeing that there were some great ones in, in the chat. Uh, 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 Becca, anyone, any that you want to draw attention to? Otherwise, I'll, I, I will uh, pick a few there and direct them at the speakers. So one of the interesting ones, uh, and I'll direct this to Sophia, uh, uh, with, with also maybe a, a, some follow-up input from Father Canis. Um, I, the question is, how has Boko Haram in Nigeria impacted specifically working with women? 
So maybe you might share with us a, a, a few of the ways, not just as as, as victims, but how are how are women, how has it impacted maybe how you engage women in some of some of the other aspects? Thanks, Kat, and uh, thanks, Stella, for that question. Um, obviously, uh, Boko Haram operates most majorly in the Northeast, and so far our work has been in the Northwest of Nigeria. However, it doesn't mean that the activities, their activities have not uh, affected us at all. In addition to that, we've had, uh, uh, you know, a spike in cases of kidnappings, banditry, and so on. As a matter of fact, I think a couple of, um, a couple of months ago, some women from our partner organization uh, narrowly missed being kidnapped, actually ran into the bush. Um, and uh, about two weeks ago, one of our volunteers in Kaduna urban area was shot and killed um, by a known gunman. And um, all of these things show us the urgency of our work. There is no doubt that these affect us every day. We have uh, states, People are living in in states of fear, and and of course, as we know, girls and women are mostly affected, and vulnerable groups are mostly affected by these kinds of states of security, or lack of lack thereof. So it is affecting just even the well-being of of citizens of of the different states. It is affecting sometimes our um, our ability to hold activities if there is such a serious security situation and we may have to, maybe the state goes on lockdown uh, or curfew, it does affect. However, that's why it's so much more important to continue to support women uh, to speak out, to speak out. And that's personally for me why I like the NSARS protests and the role that women have taken, a very courageous role, I might add. So the thing is, because we are grassroots focused, we certainly want to continue to work at those grassroots level because Every 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 person who's uh, perpetrating violence comes from somewhere. Some of them are sons, some are our brothers, some are fathers. We want to, in fact, leverage on the stereotype, the positive stereotype of the agency of women as carers and nurturers and mothers and sisters. Use that in a positive way, so that first of all, you know, we speak against. Th this kind of extremist behavior, but it's also about uh, communities understanding the value that women bring and having different, um, we have some peace initiatives in, in a couple of communities. One community um, established a cooperative because they wanted to be, they want to be seen as people in the community that should be listened to. And if uh, economic empowerment makes me uh, someone who you want to listen to, then so be it. So the women themselves are taking on these roles at community level, deciding we want to speak, we want to address issues. In Kaduna State, I think about also about two months ago, we had the women in the urban areas come out themselves and speak about the rising state of insecurity. So it's, it's about empowering, uh, supporting them, and also ensuring that we do no harm, take measures uh, whenever we are doing what we're doing. So we do not place them in situations that, that they could be vulnerable to more harm. Father? Father Canis, you're muted. You're muted. Help me from there, is it possible? Yeah, now we can hear you. Oh, you can hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Stella, for the question. And thank you, uh, Sophia, for the answers you gave. You know, as peace building organizations, um, we, we try to look at peace building from different perspectives. You know, it involves different activities. And human the human person lives uh, in situations that are influenced by different situations, economic, social, religious, cultural, and to work with women who have to look at all these areas and how what is going on with Boko Haram is impacting the lives of women. The first thing here is to think about 
the fear created by the onslaught of Boko Haram and how women have become the victims. You have to consider that psychological impact and how it makes it difficult for them to engage. But another important side of this whole thing is the voice it has given women because we, we cannot keep withdrawing. We have to come out, we have to step forward. And at that grassroots level, with the work we have done in both uh, Kajuru and Kanekon, with some uh, issues around uh, militia activities, um, herdsmen, farmers, women have realized that it is important for them to come out and speak for themselves, to collaborate, because that unity of purpose is very important. It doesn't matter. So this has helped to create some level of collaboration beyond fault lines. Women see themselves as the common victim, irrespective of religious affiliation, social, uh, ethnic, now we are women, we are suffering. If we step back, if we withdraw, this will continue to happen to us and our families and our communities. So that's one positive thing that is happening that women are coming together, looking beyond fault lines. Excellent. Thank you very much for your input, uh, uh, both Father Canis and Sophia. Um, now I would like to ask uh, her, Anessa, and Becca, if they might comment on an interesting question, which is to do with, with backlash from within your own communities. And uh, I, I know your program model has is similar to some other cross community engagement programs that that we've seen implemented uh, in tough neighborhoods like Iraq, also in uh, 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 Belfast, for example. And we're very curious how how you deal with that if you experience that backlash uh, from within and outside your own uh, community, and when it does happen, how how do you deal with that? Thank you. Thank you so much, Kat, and thank you for the question. So I think with any given community, you do get people who um, will come and say inappropriate things or uh, try to understand what you're doing or might not agree with it. At the Adam Center, we don't have anyone who has come and said we don't want. Christians at our mosque, or we don't want, you know, people of other faith, they're very, actually very welcoming. The only uh, times that I've had issues with Muslims, at the, with the events that, you know, we've done at Adam Center, is when they come and feel that they need to talk to the people of other faith about Islam and tell them that Islam is the right way to go. And again, this, this man came to one of our events, posed this question about, oh, you guys are talking about the Trinity, this is not good, you know, giving his own opinion. And I literally took his question and, and, and his postcard and put it at the end. And he saw that I did that because I didn't even ask the question because I was moderating the event. And I was like, yeah, we're not going there, sorry. I, I put it under the the, the list and, and the pile. And he came up to me later and said, you know, you didn't ask my question. And I said, yeah, and you didn't listen to the rules in the beginning because I told you this is not about that. This is about respect respecting everyone who's here, having the decency to listen and learn from them and, and get to know one another and build that relationship. I, I said, I'm sorry, I'm not going to ask your question and I'm not going to apologize for it either. You should have listened to the rules from the beginning. And so you kind of have to take a stance and, and put your foot down with people because they're going to come with their own objective and their own views on the work that you're doing as if our work is to convert people, which it's not. And that's not who we are as Muslims, our job is to worship God and to be good to human beings and be respectful and understanding in that sense. So he was coming from this perspective of, oh, you didn't ask my question. And, you know, being a female and him being a man, he was kind of like pushing himself closer to me. And I was like, yeah, no, I don't think you want my New York site to come out. So it's best you step back. And we had to have, you know, put that in the front, like front line and making sure that we're respecting ourselves and respecting people around us and not let people bully us that does happen but you have to be strong in what you believe and making sure people know that your objective is a certain thing and they have to be in line with it if they're going to come to your events and they have to respect everyone who's in that room but you as the moderator you as the event organizer need to set that um 
atmosphere for everyone who's coming in so that all the people who are coming in also are feeling safe to be in that place where they're not going to get picked on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. And Becca, did you have any anything that you wanted to add to that? I think Becca might be having technical I think, issues. Right I think, okay, I think she might. Okay. She's asking if we can hear her. No. Uh, so then let, 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 let us then uh, uh, may perhaps move on to, uh, to a, a another, another question, which is uh, to do with peace education and prevention. So uh, this, this question is, is asked by uh, Precious Titus um, and Precious would be curious about our panelists' views on using uh, peace education as a prevention mechanism to prevent uh, outbreaks of violence. And I would love to hear uh, 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 Father Canis, perhaps if, if, if you might uh, share some feedback there and, and then we'll ask for any uh, further comments from Sophia. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Kate. Um, can you hear me, please? Yes. Okay. And thank you, Precious, for the question. Um, you know, you spot on um, peace education is very, very important as a tool for prevention. I mean, we cannot overemphasize that fact. In fact, that's part of um, the work of Global Peace Foundation in some parts of Africa, especially in Kenya and other parts of the world, we have the peace education that focuses on how the values of our shared humanity should be inculcated in the younger generation to see themselves, number one, as human beings in the same human family, irrespective of one's race, background, social status, ethnicity, and religion, that we are members of one family. If we uh, bring these programs to our various communities, to our various schools, it will help to shape the character of the younger generation. And peace education is not just something that should be given to children, even adults. Peace education helps us to understand that, for instance, I don't see a Muslim as an enemy. It is called religion education, not religious education. What do I know about a Muslim? How, how have I allowed myself to be educated about another person's race, about another person's ethnicity, about another person's religion? that education is very important and should be part of the peace programs for prevention because when people realize our shared humanity when people realize that our blood is all red irrespective of where you're coming from it will help us to appreciate one another so peace education is one of the focal points of the work of Global Peace Foundation in all we do. And it is very, very important for us to advance the peace process and prevention. Thank you. So I'll just uh, thank you, Father, for that, um, for that response. I will echo the importance of peace education and really kind of reference the way generally that education in itself uh, and the way maybe it's, it's been uh, operated in a lot of uh, global South countries affects the way that we perform, or say, on development indicators. So it is... My link here is about even how we deliver that peace education. Um, we our approach is to really take it take it in a way that ensures that people are in safe spaces and feel comfortable enough 
to be able to learn about the other identity group. So, uh, for example, the approach would be, yes, the use of contact theory or the CDE model, where you create that space, which is the container. So that's the C. You have a, that container where you have people of different identities. So differences, that's D. And then with, with E, it's exchanges. So you're allowing these different people exchange, learn in sometimes very fun ways, sometimes uh, and, and infused with good reflection and discussions. And absolutely, as Father, Father Khan has said, this, this needs to be done across ages, but finding ways that it are appropriate for each age group and the context. So certainly not only does peace education support peace building where there has already been violence, but is extremely important even as a preventive uh, measure. Thank you. Kat, if I may just add something on Becca's behalf in, in the last question about, you know, getting backlash. I know with PCI, um, working with them for three years, they, they're they working through different cities all across the United States. And one of the events they had was bringing Muslims and having Muslims talk about who they are in one of the cities and having them present in front of an evangelical Christian audience. And then they had some people who were, you know, Islamophobes who actually came and tried to cause a ruckus and we're very upset that, you know, the Christians are bringing Muslims and, and listening to them and, you know, they're terrorists and they want to get rid of us and they want to take over and they want to bring Sharia law into the United States and all these th different things were said. So, you know, this evangelical Christian group that is so um, focused on peace building with uh, American Muslims here in the United States had to now talk to their own people and educate them and calm them down and make them realize that the work they're doing is to foster peace and bring connection between evangelical Christians and Muslims here in the United States. So it comes from both sides. And, and uh, uh, unfortunately, Becca was having technical issues. So I said, let me just jump in and give that as an example that both sides are getting people who uh, don't understand the work that we're doing, don't under, uh, don't respect it sometimes, but that doesn't mean we stop any of the work that we're doing and we need to move uh, ahead in everything else. That's great. Thank you very much, Haranessa. And I, I see Becca uh, 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 trying to rejoin there. Uh, um, I'm also seeing uh, uh, that, that uh, uh, Gail Hamilton has her hand raised with a question. Gail, you must be having trouble using the chat function. I'm going to unmute you here and ask you to ask your, go ahead and ask your question. Go ahead, Gail. Okay, not working. Okay, well, uh, uh, let us move on then. Uh, sorry, that didn't work. Um, we are coming just upon our time to have our panelists make closing remarks. And so let me start at the top and ask Sophia from Generations for Peace as we uh, uh, start to come to a close here on our panel. Do you have some closing thoughts to share with us? Yes, uh, sure, Kat. Could, could we have the, I'm not presenting, I think. Okay, yes. Uh, just, a, just a quick one to say that uh, for Mary, uh, absolutely, it's incredibly important to engage with uh, faith-based networks at the national level. Uh, Nigeria is a huge country, you know, in terms of population, 200 million strong and growing. So we would certainly need, uh, I mean, generally need support to be able to uh, address all the issues or address what we can with as many people. And these are things we're working towards, engaging these different groups, uh, faith groups as well at the national level. And um, also Bulls and, and the rest of uh, 
those from Niger online just really making comments about the Northeast and the big need. Absolutely, there's a big need. And um, just like anything about Nigeria, it's multi-layered, it's complicated. There are a lot of factors that are feeding into these things and the perpetuation and the cycles that are happening. So we certainly have a lot to do. We do need support to be able to do that. And, and hopefully, you know, as well, as time goes on, we will continue to try our best. Uh, I just want to really highlight the fact that uh, women as community members need to be given a voice. And it's not just about us. Uh, so I really like what uh, uh, Father said, Father Kenneth said about the construction of victimhood, understanding that you don't have to sit and wait for someone to come and, and empower you. You have to stand up yourself and, and of course, be, be facilitated and supported to do that. So it is about ensuring that spaces are given. The kind of support that women and even other uh, groups need is given to them. And uh, we also want to continue to make sure that those voices do not get lost those voices that we we highlight or facilitate, they do not get lost. We want to go beyond the talking. And this is calling on, you know, everyone, this is calling on all tracks of diplomacy and, and every stakeholder to continue to peacefully demand that which that which is our right, which is you know, um, a peaceful society, it's understanding that we're different and that there is will always be conflict, but ensuring that the voices that are amplified are not lost, beginning to ask for accountability and continuing to do so, playing a part in monitoring what happens in our communities and having the courage to speak up when we can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sophia. Uh, Becca, uh, thanks for rejoining us. Glad to see you on there. Uh, we are just having our closing comments now and would love to hear uh, three minutes or so from yourself. Thank you. You appear to be muted. We are not hearing you. Yeah, I think she's having technical issues. She's I think so there. too. Uh, her, Nessa, uh, uh, Be Becca, I'm so sorry. We can't hear you at all. Uh, uh, maybe you want to try with just your audio only and turn the webcam off if you think you're having bandwidth issues. Let's see if that helps. Otherwise, we will move forward to her, Anessa. Oh, she's still muted. Oh, dear. Her, Anessa, would you like to move forward with your closing comments? There you go. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I think it's, it's it's catching on all of us now. There's technical difficulty. Okay. Um, but Can what you I want to say is that... Uh, yeah, go ahead, Becca. I don't think she can hear us. Um, okay, I'll go if she comes back. Okay. <laughs> to speak. Um, so it, when it comes to multi-faith work, and uh, I've been doing this for almost um, four years now, I've noticed that, you know, one of the things that is the most important thing to me is having women at the table. And women, really, when you feel that this is something that you want to be a part of, don't let anyone hold you back. Don't be upset if there's no seat for you at the table. Like they say, bring a folding chair, bring it with you, sit there, make sure Can your you hear voice me now? is heard. Times. Um, Hello. <laughs> yeah, we can hear you. Becca, can you hear us? 
a lot of times what we end up doing is is sitting on the sideline oh the men are going to be talking and especially muslim women because a lot of times at these events people want the imams to come and speak the rabbis to come and speak and the pastors to come and speak well as muslims there are no female imams so the minute you say you want an imam you completely alienate women as a whole they're not at the table they're never going to be at the table so we need to change the verbiage of the things that we're using to include women of different faiths at the table um, you know, we have female scholars, we have females who can, you know, are articulate, who can actually talk about a subject matter and come across and actually have conversations with people in a meaningful way and in a way to change not just perspective, but also change what the community is going through. And I think that's the main focus of why women need to be involved in every different aspect of work that we're doing, but especially in the multi-faith world is because I see women as innovative, they're creative, they think outside of the box, they're fun, it's not dry conversation, and no offense to men, they're great also, but when you don't have women, there's a lot that's lacking in the conversation, and I know all the women here can, can attest to that and agree with me. So including women actually makes your project even more enhanced. It brings more depth into it, it brings more, um, uh, you know, creativity in there where, you know, there's excitement and there's, uh, you know, a a push and a power of, of people who actually want to get work and, and be part of that. And women can do everything men can do, right? But of course, we need to open that space up. And one of the things that I've been working hard on is trying to find avenues where women, regardless of faith, regardless of where they're from, regardless of race, have that opportunity to, to voice their opinion and be involved in something that they normally would not be involved so look around you, find women who are, you know, really, you know, bridge builders and peacemakers and bring them into your organization, have them be part of the conversation. And you'll see that your organization and the aspect of what you're trying to reach is going to change tremendously. So if, if, if you don't get take anything away from me today, uh, just take this that that women need to be involved in every different aspect of life. Thank you. Thanks, Haranessa. And uh, we'll come back to Becca at the end and try again. However, let me now uh, request that Father Canis Anyake from Global Peace Foundation, if you could share with us your closing comments. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you, Kate. And once again, thanks to all who have been able to join us today. Um, one of the things that attracted me to work for Global Peace Foundation is the vision that all humans are members of one family. That vision also is the motivation of the work Global Peace Foundation does around the world. When we see everyone as a member of our family, just looking at our biological or natural family, where siblings don't have the same height, don't have the same complexion sometimes, don't have the same social status, but they are siblings. That understanding of ontological sibling is very important as we work for uh, a world built around sustainable peace and development. What it means is that every one of us can be a peace builder in your community, at your workplace, wherever you are. Let's try to move from this narrow identity of religion, ethnicity. If we keep working and building identity, we cannot stop. There is no stop to it. But when we see the other as a member of the same family, then what we have to do is to look for the inclusive way of transforming relationship, of building a common home where people are respected, where everyone is validated, where we respect, listen to one another. It's not just tolerance, it's respect, because we are not the same and we cannot be the same but we can respect one another just as we do in our biological families. And to achieve this, women must be allowed 
that space that is needed for them to participate actively in the peace process around the world, um, especially in my country, Nigeria, where we work, we have to find a way to see one another as a sibling. If not, it's not going to work. We really need it. I'm sure there are people from Nigeria listening to us today who join this conversation. We need to start looking at one another as humans. Thank you. Thank you, Father Canis, for that closing inspiration. Uh, Becca, good to see you back. Uh, would you like to try and make a, a closing statement from PCI? Go ahead, Becca, if you're able. Okay, so I think Becca must still be having some technical difficulties. Uh, I want Hello. to uh, thank, oh. Go ahead, Hello. we can hear you. Yes. Can you hear we me? We can hear you, yes. Okay. I think there's a delay. Uh, thank you, everyone. For your... <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, I just wanted to. Oh, I just wanted to say um, how much I appreciate being here with you all, and it's so wonderful to um, see so many of us building inclusive peace and. Um, highlighting how important the role of women is. And just wanted to say that, you know, including women is great. And we also need women to be leading. We need women to be at the forefront of peace building because that, um, has proven to be successful and um, just wanted to also say that we can all create change in our communities um, when we're willing to look at the Okay. Well, th thank you, Becca. Uh, sorry you've had some technical problems there. Uh, uh, we appreciate your, 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 your comments. And we're going to wrap up here. Uh, 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 I want to appreciate all of our panelists as well as our audience and participants. Um, this has been the PeaceCon 2020 presentation of Women Building Inclusive Peace. And it's been my pleasure uh, to participate representing Global Peace Foundation and getting to know the good work of Generations for Peace, the Adams Center, and also Peace Catalyst. So many thanks to each of our panelists for their insights and wisdom. And thanks to each of you who are willing to invest your time to learn more about the innovative approaches from the Washington DC area and Nigeria. Thank you very much. This concludes our event.